All right, we're live. Hey, hello everyone. How's everyone doing? We're, uh, I'm really excited for today's topic. Uh, I'm also in a bit of a, you've probably all noticed a different change of scenery. Uh, been a bit of a crazy time for me, so Richard's taking this over for today. <laughs> it's a good topic. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nate. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, I'm here at home, not in our, not in our fun meeting rooms. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, making the most of it, I'm, I'm drinking a Jelly King from our friends at Bellwoods Brewery. Uh, I actually haven't had Jelly King in a long time, um, so it's nice to uh, revisit it. I have to drive after this, so I have water. <laughs> okay, classic, the classic move. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, for those who are uh, following along at home, feel free to post what you're what you're what you're drinking or what you're trying uh, as we dive into the topic of oxygen and beer. Yeah. Um, also, just want to make sure uh, if you if something comes up and it doesn't make sense, uh, ask us a question. Uh, we have that feature in the Crowdcast down below. I'll Click be that. curating those throughout today. So just if you have questions, we'll uh, we'll bring it at the end, or I'll answer quickly during the presentation. Sweet. Okay, uh, we're gonna jump right into it. All right. Okay. All right, let's do this. Oxygen in brewing and why it matters. Uh, I'm definitely very passionate about this topic. I think it's uh, one of the elements of brewing that is um, kind of a dark art, kind of not as well understood as it could be. And, you know, fortunately, I think it, it when we break it down into individual components and understand it better um, oxygenation uh, in brewing uh, becomes a relatively simple uh, thing um, and and it becomes a really useful tool that we can use to control flavor uh, tool we can use to control the performance of our yeast and, and also a critical thing to make sure that our yeast is happy so what are we going to cover here um, of course we're going to cover chernobyl memes uh, I hope that wasn't too dated, but I, I felt like we did an all right job uh, on the marketing front. Um, <laughs> we're going to cover why yeast needs oxygen. We're going to cover which yeast need more oxygen than others. It should come as no surprise to you that we're going to be talking about how uh, different yeasts are different characters and require different things. We're going to be talking about the impact of oxygenation on yeast flavor and how that can be a dial to control what you get out of your yeast. We're going to talk about, and this is really the big uh, area of mystery, I think, that a lot of brewers find, is how and when to add oxygen to your wort. And we'll talk about that both on the pro and the homebrew scale, so that uh, you can take that home. And uh, if uh, the way that you're oxygenating isn't optimal, then, then you might be able to make some improvements, and you might see uh, that improvement in your brewery or homebrewery uh, right away. And we're also going to talk about how to measure wort dissolved oxygen, because um, it's something that's... You know, oftentimes oxygen is added to wort, but it's very rarely measured. So we're going to talk about some easy ways that it can be uh, measured. So a caveat, first of all, like many things in beer science, our knowledge is based largely on English translations of arcane German technical books and some guy's thesis from the 70s. Uh, this is the case for a lot of important brewing science topics, um, and it is what it is. So some of what we present may end up being refined in the future as more beer science happens. Uh, especially as uh, uh, some of the context of craft brewery and small brewing is is uh, considered. So, you know, that's my caveat. This might be outdated two years from now. If it is, that's great because it means that more beer science has happened. So why does yeast need oxygen? Adding oxygen to your word, it's important for the yeast health. You probably have heard that before. I don't think that this is necessarily new information. Um, and there are some sort of standard rules of thumb for this. So uh, the often the one that you often see is uh, one part per million dissolved oxygen per degree Play-Doh is a good rule of thumb. And the nice thing there is that it tracks pretty well with the, the standard yeast pitching rate of one million cells per mil per degree Play-Doh. Um, so for example, if we were doing a 12 Play-Doh beer, we would add uh, 12 parts per million of dissolved oxygen into that, that beer. Um, and that for most fermentations would, would give us uh, 
a good amount of oxygen to ensure that the yeast is healthy and happy. Uh, if we don't have enough oxygen in our wort, uh, it often means that the yeast is going to have a longer lag time. It's going to take longer for it to grow, uh, or you might end up with off flavors at the end uh, in the beer. Things like acetaldehyde or diacetyl that are indicators of poor yeast health, indicators of a yeast that's struggling to get through the fermentation uh, tend to come up quite a lot um, if you have a yeast or a beer that's been poorly oxygenated. And the reason for this is that yeast needs oxygen for it to build more yeasts, especially for the synthesis of these things called sterols that uh, are a key part of the cell membrane of the yeast, the little sort of um, phospholipid uh, bag that contains all of the uh, important enzymatic goodness of the yeast cell. Uh, these sterols help the yeast with uh, ensuring the right fluidity of these membranes. It helps the yeast cell with uh, tolerating stressors, especially things like alcohol. Uh, high alcohol environment is really stressful for the yeast cell. It's stressful for these membranes. Having a higher uh, sterile content can help the yeast to um, resist that environment and continue to perform. Uh, another thing worth mentioning is that you can go too far with oxygen as well. Too much oxygen can also lead to, um, you know, the yeast culture can grow too fast and uh, that can lead to a reduction in flavor impact for some yeast strains. So which yeast needs more oxygen? Uh, I had to bring back the hungry, hungry yeasties for this one. Um, in general, and you know, this is based largely on anecdote, but uh, we're talking with a lot of brewers all the time, so it's been uh, good to get this feedback. In general, we find that English ale yeast and kvike uh, often have the greatest need for oxygen. Uh, those are the ones that always seem to benefit from a brewer dialing in the oxygenation process, getting the yeast, the oxygen it needs, and, and improving those fermentations. Uh, some of the Belgian strains also like a lot of oxygen. A lot of those are traditionally used in open fermentations, just like the English strains and the kvikes. So yeasts that come from a tradition of open fermentation tend to have a greater need for oxygen. Lager yeasts are somewhere in the middle. Uh, they, they, they tend to, you know, if, if a brewer is going to give a yeast a lot of oxygen, it usually tends to be the lager yeast, but um, they don't have an abnormally high requirement for oxygen. Uh, and one thing that, that we think is interesting is that American ale yeast seem to be pretty tolerant to low concentrations of oxygen. They seem to uh, generally across the board not require a lot in the way of uh, nutrients, including oxygen. And that might explain why oxygenation is such a point of mystery in uh, commercial brewing, especially North American uh, craft brewing, because a lot of brewers trained on these American ale yeast, right? Like most brewers start out with something like USO5 or uh, Chico ale yeast. Um, that ultimately doesn't really get stressed out if it's getting uh, not very much oxygen. It'll power through the fermentation, keep going, be fine with repitching. But then when those brewers start having to respond to trends uh, in the market, like hazy IPAs made with English yeast, all of a sudden there's, there's problems and they're, you know, the beers are stalling out or the yeast is hard to repitch um, because the different yeasts require different concentrations of oxygen. So it's hard to predict this. It's also hard to measure this. I will, you know, upfront say we have not done any large study looking at uh, the oxygen consumption of, of a huge range of our strains. We've, we've looked at a few of them in propagations, but, um, you know, nothing comprehensive. But, you know, one thing we have noticed is that there does seem to be a correlation between a yeast's oxygen requirements and uh, the amount of fan, free amino nitrogen, that it consumes in the wort. So... You know, for example, we have yeast down here like Cali and Anchorman that are pretty pretty low fan requires, and also we know that they don't require a whole lot in the way of dissolved oxygen. And then if you look at the, the British strains and the Belgian strains and the Kvikes, they tend to be a little bit above average in terms of their fan requirements, and we, we know that they're above average in terms of their oxygen requirements as well. So uh, oftentimes if a yeast needs more of one nutrient, like, like uh, free amino nitrogen, they often need more of another nutrient like oxygen. And oxygenation has an impact on yeast viability, and it especially has an impact when that yeast is repitched. Um, we did a study way back now in 2017 and 2018. Um, this was the, the first study that Isneto did. Um, 
where we looked at uh, yeast performance through repitching. Uh, in the ferment, in the study design, we had three generations up front that got uh, inadequate oxygen, six parts per million, um, and then the remaining generations got uh, 16 parts per million, so quite a lot. Uh, definitely adequate oxygen for uh, most of these strains, and we tested with with four different uh, strains of yeast. And uh, what we found was that uh, for a lot of these strains, the viability really suffered uh, in those early generations when the yeast was not getting adequate oxygen. And then once the uh, wort aeration or oxygenation got better, uh, we tended to see much better viability of that yeast at the end of the ferment. So um, the ability of that yeast to incorporate oxygen, make sterols, and then tolerate the alcohol that it's producing um, does impact the viability. And I would say, you know, for example, this, uh, you know, these yeasts that are in the 70, 80% range, if those kept getting repitched, we would probably start to see off flavors and stalled ferments and all sorts of uh, bad stuff. So um, you might get away with it for one generation, but insufficient oxygenation really can impact the quality of a yeast pitch when it's used for many generations. And this is especially clear when you store the yeast. So this is from that same project. We took that stored yeast, uh, cropped off the fermenters, and then checked its viability uh, when it was stored in the fridge over time. You know, this is very common for brewers to harvest yeast into a you know, yeast brink or a mason jar and store it for a number of weeks and then repitch it after storage. Uh, and what we saw is that the generations that received adequate oxygenation um, had a better shelf life. They didn't lose viability as fast as the ones that did not have good oxygenation. And, and you can see for some of these strains, the difference is quite dramatic, right? Like uh, for the, the California ale or the Vermont, uh, these early generations are pretty much toast by the time we're hitting week three or four, uh, whereas the uh, oxygenated um, yeast samples are um, doing quite well, you know. I would be fairly comfortable using a lot of these even up to seven or eight weeks, which is quite impressive. So that's that's really the take home here is that good wort oxygenation can extend the life of the yeast uh, even once it's uh, cropped uh, to be repitched. And this is one way that um, brewers who are not uh, using a yeast very often, you know, maybe you're only using a a certain Belgian strain every eight weeks, um, making sure that it's really, really happy in the fermenter might be a way that you can stretch that culture a little bit more um, and, and save some money. And then of course, oxygenation is important in the propagation step too. If you are propping yeast or if you're wondering what's going on behind the scenes uh, in the yeast lab, um, Usually when you're propagating yeast, you're exposing it continuously to oxygen, but it doesn't mean that the yeast is necessarily, uh, uh, or the yeast medium is necessarily seeing the same amount of dissolved oxygen. So, you know, what we've seen time and time again is that when a yeast culture grows, the biomass increases, we start to see a greater concentration of that dissolved oxygen absorbed by the culture. So, for example, this is a, a shake flask, so just a a, a, a flask of yeast on a on a shake table. So that means that it's going to constantly be shaken up and uh, exposed to oxygen. So, you know, if there's no yeast present, you would expect it to be at around this seven and a half, eight parts per million dissolved oxygen. But as the yeast culture grows, it's actively picking up the, uh, uh, the dissolved oxygen to the point where you, know, you can have a yeast culture on a, on a shake flask towards the end of its, uh, towards the end of its propagation. And you can have very, very low measurable DO because that yeast is just gobbling up that oxygen as soon as it finds it. Um, and, you know, this is okay while it's consuming sugars, um, but it can be a risk when the yeast runs out of sugars because um, if the yeast isn't consuming sugars and making more yeasts, um, you start to stress out the yeast. They're going to have to um, put their mitochondria to more work. Uh, they're going to have to deal with things like reactive oxygen species that can be uh, toxic to the cell and cause the cells to age faster. Uh, and this is especially true in the presence of, of alcohol, which is which is always going to be there uh, in propagations and fermentations. So it's, it's something to watch out for. Um, and, you know, one of the key points here is that oxygen's great for the yeast uh, when there's uh, when there's sugar present. It's great for the yeast in propagation um, to a point, but it's uh, not great for the yeast when it's 
run out of um, oxygen. So uh, for those who are doing props, um, whether it's homebrew, you know, on a stir plate or um, in a brewery, I would also, you know, do some trials and measure your specific gravities in your props because you might find that uh, you're, um, you're spinning or, or aerating that yeast for longer than you should be. Um, and that might have an impact on the yeast quality. So really helps to do those SG checks. And it, when it's at a acceptable final gravity, I would stop stirring or aerating because you'll probably get a higher yeast quality that way. So yeah, it always comes down to the, the powerhouse of the cell, right? Um, one thing we can always take home from this and remember from grade eight science is that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, but it has its limits. Um, if you throw a bunch of oxygen at a bunch of yeast cells um, that are aging, uh, their mitochondria are gonna have to deal with all of that toxic oxygen and uh, eventually get stressed out and eventually things are gonna go wrong in the cell. But one of the things we hear a lot is that it, you know people are concerned about adding too much oxygen because it might oxidize the beer. Um, and I was able to dig up some pretty old but very useful data um, that helps to explain why uh, warp DO probably doesn't oxidize the beer. Um, if you're adding dissolved oxygen to the beer and uh, to the wort and um, pitching yeast, uh, as we saw before, yeast is really, really good at gobbling up dissolved oxygen. Um, so, you know, in this trial, for example, they saw that all of the dissolved oxygen, pretty much measurable dissolved oxygen that they um, could observe in the wort was taken up by the yeast within about an hour uh, of the fermentation of, of the yeast being pitched. Um, so yeah, you're really, whatever oxygen is put into the wort is going to get consumed by the yeast very quickly. So how do we oxygenate wort? Um, there's a few general rules of thumb. Uh, one thing that's important is that the solubility of oxygen into wort is better at colder temperatures. It's really just like getting any, any gas into solution. So practically speaking, it's going to be easier for you to oxygenate a lager versus a kvike ferment. Uh, if you're oxygenating a, a 10 degrees Celsius wort, uh, you're going to need to use less oxygen to get it all into solution versus if you're oxygenating a 30 degrees Celsius wort. Um, it works very much like carbonation, right? Where it's easier to get the gas, it's easier and more efficient to get the gas into solution when the temperature of the liquid is colder, right? So at the end of the day, solubility of gases is solubility of gases. It doesn't change that much. So that's an important thing, rule of thumb to keep in mind. I think most brewers understand how carbonation works and you can think about oxygenation in a very similar manner. Uh, one thing to mention, because this does come up, is that um, using air alone, so either on the homebrew scale, like shaking the carboy or um, on the pro scale, um, injecting compressed air, that's going to max you out at about eight parts per million dissolved oxygen because uh, you have to keep in mind that air itself is only 21% oxygen. So there is a maximum amount of oxygen that you can pump into uh, the wort by using compressed air or air itself. So uh, what a lot of brewers do is use pure oxygen because that allows for the, uh, the option of achieving a, a much higher dissolved oxygen if, if required. Um, and then once again, going back to uh, <laughs> some very old but very good data on, uh, on uh, saturation of, of wort um, at different gravities and at different temperatures. So that's another thing worth mentioning too is that um, the solubility uh, of oxygen into the wort is better the closer it is to water. So uh, if you're looking at high gravity beers, for example, um, you're going to require you're going to need to add more oxygen to get the same um, dissolved oxygen content. So you know, especially keeping in mind that uh, high grav beers tend to require a lot more um, dissolved oxygen because we need that yeast to be really healthy to handle the high alcohol content. Uh, it helps to really, really blast those uh, super high uh, gravity warts uh, in, in order to assure that the yeast is getting enough oxygen. And that's often why you see uh, brewers recommend or, or practice uh, double oxygenating. If they're doing something like an imperial stout or a barley wine, uh, they might oxygenate pitch yeast uh, 
and then oxygenate it again 12 hours later. What they're doing is just trying to get enough oxygen into that wort so that the yeast can grow and be happy and not get stressed out by the alcohol and produce off flavors. Uh, how do we calculate oxygenation? There are some formulas. Uh, I'm going to keep referring to uh, this Dawson 2018. This is a, a poster that came from a uh, Brewer Summit conference um, from a guy named Derek Dawson at Modern Times. Uh, he did a, a small study just to measure and, and assess oxygenation in their brewery. Uh, and it it's really, really helpful. I, I hadn't seen any other information on uh, craft beer scale oxygenation. So Highly recommend checking that out. And, you know, big thanks to him for putting that study together and sharing it. I'll be sharing a bunch of other uh, images from that uh, from that poster as well. So um, we can actually calculate and predict how much oxygen we can get into a beer. Um, for every liter of oxygen, we can get about uh, 1,430 uh, milligrams of uh, into uh, the wort stream. Um, so 1.4 grams. Um, so, you know, there's an equation provided here and just as a practical example, um, that, that, um, modern times provided, they, they sort of said, okay, you can, you can have a wart knockout with 72 liters per minute, uh, flow, you know, from, from the heat exchanger to the tank, uh, and they're injecting one liter per minute of oxygen. So they know that that one, uh, in one minute of transfer, they're going to add one liter of oxygen into 74 liters of wart. So, Therefore, they're going to be adding, you know, 1,430 milligrams of oxygen over 74 liters of wort. That's going to give us a handy dandy number in milligrams per liter, which just so happens to be exactly the same as parts per million. So they're able to predict, okay, uh, this should give us 19.3 parts per million uh, dissolved oxygen. And they actually went and measured it and found it was 18 point something. So uh, their prediction was was pretty good. And at least in in this example in this brewery, they were able to achieve a pretty efficient um, oxygen saturation. On the homebrew scale, uh, what we often see is a general rule of thumb of 30 to 60 seconds of pure oxygen using a stone in the fermenter, right? It's very common to see these little uh, adapter rigs that you can screw onto those small welding oxygen tanks that you get from like a hardware store. Um, often attached to a, a hose and then a sintered stone um, to help bubble that oxygen. And, and then you kind of stick the thing into your fermenter, uh, open up the valve for 30 to 60 seconds and your wort's oxygenated, you pitch your yeast and you know, you're ready to go. Um, and the thing I just sort of wanted to point out here is that the math really does support that, right? If we assume, you know, using the math from the previous slide, if we assume that we've got a 20 liter batch and we're adding probably one, 0.5 to 1 liters per minute. I'm assuming that's what these homebrew rigs max out at, and I, I think that's about correct, uh, just based on some reading that I was doing. Um, that should yield adequate oxygenation, uh, assuming that there's some inefficiency here versus um, oxygenating the wort and sending it through a hose uh, across a, a whole brewery. Um, this is going to be a little less efficient at getting oxygen into solution, but um, since we're going to be oxygenating a smaller amount of liquid, uh, for a comparatively longer amount of time, it kind of evens out. And this this does hold true. And, and there have been a couple uh, homebrew bloggers that have done these tests and checked the DO and found that um, this general rule of thumb, you know, maybe 30 seconds for a standard beer and 60 seconds for a high gravity beer uh, does hold true. So that's cool. On the brewery scale, I'm um, just providing an example from Dawson at Modern Times. Um, for you know their process and then also how they were measuring uh, the dissolved oxygen uh, in their wort. Um, breweries tend to aerate in line. So you often have a uh, hot wort coming off a whirlpool, going through a heat exchanger, getting cooled down, and then often uh, right near that heat exchanger outlet, you have uh, a tea with an oxygen stone, another a bigger sintered stone. Oxygen's being injected in. Uh, usually the, the brewery's controlling uh, flow rate uh, and pressure, and then there is some length of hose, and then it's uh, the wort is pumped into uh, the tank and filled up, and then yeast is pitched. So uh, typically, what you see recommended in breweries is is something like 
one to two liters per minute. Uh, we also tend to recommend pressure, uh, regulating the pressure as well. Um, so 15, 20 PSI, uh, you can get pressure regulators for O2 tanks as well. Um, something to mention here is that that oxygen stone has to be cleaned. These things foul really easily. Uh, we do strongly recommend inspecting it for blockage because, you know, especially if you don't have a DO meter for measuring the wort dissolved oxygen, then it's going to be really, really hard to uh, know when there's something wrong with the oxygen stone. And so then if you're letting this get to the point of a stalled ferment or a unhappy yeast, then you're going to have to do a lot of, you know, back tracing and, and root cause analysis to figure out what went wrong. And in some cases, it's just a dirty oxygen stone. So I would recommend, you know, paying attention to those things and um, consider investing in a, in a sonicating bath for cleaning it. That can work really well. And definitely do not sanitize these things in boiling hot uh, water that's not, um, that is not distilled uh, or, or very soft because uh, you definitely don't want to boil an oxygen stone in hard water because you're just going to get calcium deposits on those pores and it's not going to be as effective. And, and we've seen that before as well. So avoid that. Uh, make sure that you're uh, properly cleaning the oxygen stone. It's really important. And then another thing that's really important with uh, the pro brewery method of oxygenation is that uh, you need some length in that hose in order for that gas to actually go into solution. So if you're using a short hose, what you can have happen is that you're putting oxygen bubbles into the wart and if the especially if your flow rate is pretty fast you can have that wart flow into the tank oxygen bubbles flowing you know yeah some are going into suspension but you can have the system working in a way where you're bubbling a bunch of oxygen into wart and it's not even going into suspension by the time the wart is in the tank and so you're just literally just oxygenating your brewery at that point so uh, it does help to have a longer hose run. Uh, breweries have seen that uh, improve oxygenation, um, and it's something really important to to watch out for, especially if you've if you've got a brewery that's that's arranged where some tanks are closer to the brew house than others, which is pretty much every brewery. We would recommend standardize your hose run, your hose length uh, from your brew house uh, heat exchanger to your uh, fermenter because it is a process variable. It is, it is, it does play a role in determining how much oxygen uh, you're adding to your wort. Um, so would recommend standardizing that and that can help with dialing in processes and making sure that the, the, the tanks close to the brew house aren't uh, fermenting way better than, uh, way worse than the tanks that are far away. Uh, if you can measure the DO and we're going to recommend it and we're going to suggest some easy ways to do it, uh, as a starting point, we suggest eight to 10 parts per million for most yeast. So that's also where you can get there with compressed air at the low end. And, and that is why that does work for a lot of uh, yeasts, um, especially things like California ale. Uh, we're coming a little bit more for lagers, 10 to 15 parts per million. And then, and then really, uh, uh, at least 15 parts per million for, uh, English ale strains, uh, especially the ones that are used for hazy IPAs like foggy London, London three, Vermont ale kind of thing. Um, those are really, really oxygen hungry yeast. They really benefit from getting enough oxygen. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that paid off in terms of performance and in terms of flavor. So uh, we're going to talk about this modern times study is again. Um, they actually tested this, uh, you know, the impact of the flow rate, right? Because the general recommendation is one to two liters per minute. They tested uh, the impact of the flow rate on the measured dissolved oxygen um, that they were getting um, at the bottom of their tank. So they did say they tested up to three liters per minute, but in the graph they show from zero to um, one liters per minute uh, on an 80 foot hose run in this case. And uh, it's pretty cool because uh, what they measured matched quite closely to what you would expect from the math. So that helps us to, to know that uh, in this case, the math does kind of scale down to the um, craft brewery uh, size and is relevant to us. So, you know, we know, for example, if uh, at least in this case where you're using uh, one liter per minute oxygen in 
an 80 foot hose run, you're going to get a pretty good amount of dissolved oxygen that, that should be sufficient for uh, performance of most yeasts and that it can be dialed in from there as well. Like some yeasts do not necessarily need this much. Uh, they did also see, for example, that if they did go beyond that one liter per minute, even as far as three liters per minute, um, they saw better performance with some of their strains. So London 3, um, classic English yeast used for hazy IPAs, uh, also classically oxygen hungry, uh, clearly benefits from uh, excess or, or increased oxygenation uh, in terms of, you know, this is the degree of fermentation, so the, the attenuation. Um, and they found a you know, similar thing as we have where some strains do, just don't require as much, right? Uh, the Chico California Ale and Augustiner, like a German lager strain, uh, were fine with a standard 8 to 10 parts per million, but uh, they needed to crank up the DO to get that London 3 to attenuate. Uh, so another... Uh, Big, uh, I think, point of confusion that uh, doesn't need to be so confusing in big breweries is filling big fermenters. This is a very common thing that breweries have to do. Um, oftentimes, the brew house is smaller than the biggest tanks. So, you know, maybe you've got a 40 barrel tank and your brew house is 20 barrels. So you're going to have to brew twice to fill it. And that results in a lot of different strategies being used in terms of how the wort is oxygenated and how the yeast is pitched. Um, so, what we will uh, suggest as general rules is do not oxygenate your wort hours before pitching the yeast. So where we often see this come up is a, is a brewer will um, brew uh, one batch of wort, put it into the tank with oxygen, brew the second batch of wort, and then, and then pitch the yeast. Well, the first uh, run of oxygen, the first uh, injection of oxygen that you gave that first batch of wort is going to be gone. It's actually going to be consumed by oxidizable compounds in the wort itself. Uh, and that's not good, right? You're literally using uh, potential flavor compounds from the malt and the hops as electron acceptors. And uh, it's gonna consume the DO and the yeast is gonna get none of it. So uh, that's, that's bad news bears, you don't want that. Um, so do pitch your yeast on the first fill. If you're filling a tank two plus times, uh, pitch the yeast on the first fill and Oxygenate each fill if you can. Um, we have seen some, th there's been some good studies uh, showing that in a case with multiple fills, like three, four, five, and it's all happening in the same day. So if you're like a super efficient macro brewery or something like that, uh, you can skip oxygen on the middle fill or fills. Um, but in general, it's a good idea um, to oxygenate each fill. Uh, where there's a little bit of a, a gray area is if you're filling your tanks on sequential days, right? Like you've got a 40 barrel tank, you can only do one brew per day. Um, the jury's somewhat out as to whether you should or should not oxygenate on that second day. And I would say it comes down to your yeast strain, it comes down to your beer. Some fermentations do benefit from this. Like for example, a high gravity ferment, uh, you know, say you're <laughs> brewing a barley wine and you've, uh, you're boiling it down, so you're having to do sequential brews, then yeah, definitely oxygenate the second day. As we saw, you know, a, a fermenter or propagation full of yeast is gonna gobble up any DO that's added pretty much instantaneously. So it's not a huge risk in terms of uh, creating any kind of like oxidized off flavors in the beer, and it might help the yeast. So how do we measure it? This is, I think, the biggest area of mystery when it comes to uh, dissolved oxygen in, in, in breweries. I think a lot of folks assume that a DO meter is a DO meter and that a DO meter is $20,000. That's true if you're measuring DO in your packaged beer, where you need to measure parts per billion, right? You need to measure tiny amounts of oxygen. The kind of device that you need for your wart is a, is a DO meter that measures in parts per million. So a thousand times less sensitive. Um, so what that means is that uh, there are parts per million level uh, DO meters that are many times more affordable than the parts per billion level DO meters. Uh, and there are not a lot of devices that do both, nor would I recommend doing both. You want uh, a wart level DO meter that's rugged and can put up with abuse, whereas your um, really nice, uh, DO meter that you're using for checking your package beer can can live safely in the lab. 
Um, and yeah, this is this is worth mentioning. There are handheld DO meters that are affordable to breweries. You do get what you pay for. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend some of the super cheap units uh, out there, um, but you can get a, a pretty good DO meter for around a thousand bucks, often less if you look used. You know, we got one used for fifty bucks that works pretty well. So uh, that does mean that there's a pretty clear return on investment uh, in terms of your beer quality, right? Because it's one thing to measure the flow rate of your oxygen. That does not tell you how much oxygen is in your beer. Measuring DO does, and you can get a device to do it for really not that much money. You can know exactly how many ppm of oxygen went into your wort, and that gives you really key data that you can use to dial in your processes, dial in your beers, and you know keep your yeast alive longer, speed up your ferments, uh, really see a lot of improvements in the brewery. So. Uh, there's just a couple of options that, that I showed here. I know uh, in that modern time study, they used this uh, meter from Hanna, uh, which looked like it was well under a thousand bucks. And um, we've had really good luck with uh, meters from YSI. Uh, they build really rugged ones. Like they're not necessarily meant for breweries. They're meant for like field sampling. Like if you have to go into the middle of a river and measure the DO, that's what they're built for. And so they're, they're pretty darn tough. Um, a lot of these 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 things are, are available and we would recommend, you know, if you're a brewery to invest in these things um, right away if you don't have one. And then there's one thing, there's having the meter, there's also measuring wort dissolved oxygen. So I showed the diagram for what Modern Times did where they, they basically hooked up a T on the bottom of the fermenter um, and they uh, had, you know, one end of the T going through a valve into a bucket and they were measuring um the dissolved oxygen of the of the wort coming out of that uh bottom of the tank uh that'll work pretty well um nate niz uh from our team a couple years back came up with this this alternative so you know we had a project where we needed to measure uh do of wort uh in the tank during the yeast propagation so we needed a way to get uh to measure the do coming off of a, a you know a, a sanitary sample valve um, so we came up with this from parts that were pretty much just lying around the lab. And I, I guarantee that pretty much every brewery has a few random T's and tri-clamp fittings kicking around and could replicate this. So, you know, this system works pretty well, really, for any DO measurement. You just need a way to flow the wart over or past the uh, DO probe um, so that you can get a uh, stable reading. So... What we would do here is we can hook up this hose to a sanitized sample port. Um, we could actually, this is all silicone and, and uh, steel, so we could actually autoclave this whole rig if we were worried about sanitation. Um, hook that up, flow some wort through, like open up the sample port, that wort flows up, it flows out this <laughs> outlet here. We can stick our probe in the top, uh, sort of float it right around, oops, right around here, and uh, we can get a stable reading of the DO uh, in that tank. Um, and yeah, this whole thing can be clip, clamped to some part of the tank to make it relatively stable. Um, so that works. That worked pretty well for us. Uh, don't have to get anything fancy. You can slap a few tri-clamp fittings together and get a pretty good rig to measure your dissolved oxygen. Uh, or yeah, tee it off, run it into a bucket under the fermenter. That works as well. So before we finish up, I also just wanted to address uh, some of the, probably some of the questions that are going to come up and some of the conflicting info that's out there that makes uh, this conversation around wort oxygenation uh, more complicated. Uh, the first one is that, you know, and we've heard this from folks, is that you don't need to add oxygen to beers that use dry yeast. Um, you, you'll hear that said by uh, dry yeast manufacturers and that is true, right? They manufacture the yeast so that it has a good sterile reserve. Um, the thing that I'll add here to clarify is that so do liquid yeast manufacturers. Um, I would say that I would be pretty comfortable using most liquid yeasts uh, in the first generation in a poorly or not an aerated wort because I know that the yeast is really healthy. I know that it's got a good uh, reserve of sterols and storage carbohydrates. It's going to be fine to power through that first generation. But after that, it's going to suffer if it's repeatedly not getting fed uh, the oxygen that it wants. So, you know, our MO is to make sure that you treat your yeast well and reuse it. Um, and, and that uh, you can get away with not oxygenating, but it's probably going to bite you later on 
if you try to reuse the yeast. <laughs> and then the other one we hear a lot is, oh, can I just add a drop of olive oil? I saw this study from New Belgium, and they said that I can just add olive oil to my, to my wort, uh, and it does the same thing as oxygenating. That appears to work in theory. That is that is what they tested. Um, but they did find, if, if you go and read the, the New Belgium study on adding olive oil to, to wort, uh, they did see some flavor differences. And uh, it is a bit of a challenge in the sense that you can't just add olive oil to uh, your beer. You have to uh, dissolve it in ethanol, like high strength ethanol first, and then dilute that down to get the right concentration of, um, of um, olive oil. And um, there are some indications that this might not work for every strain either. You know, they tested one yeast strain. We know that every yeast is different. Uh, we did a couple trials with linoleic acid, which is one of the fatty acids in olive oil, um, and some of our lager yeasts. And we found that it, it actually had a negative impact on the performance of some of them when it was added um, to the yeast. So uh, the jury's a little bit out with that. And uh, I would caution against uh, the olive oil approach until there's uh, more research been done because we know that oxygen works. Uh, so that's it for me. I wanted to keep this one relatively brief. I know we've had a couple pretty long webinars, so I wanted to sort of go out and uh, give you a brief overview of how uh, oxygenation matters in wort and uh, how you can improve your beer quality. Uh, I do want to thank you for listening. I do want to say happy holidays. This is our last webinar of 2020. There have been, God, uh, so many now. <laughs> we will be back in 2021. We will have more content for you guys. This is one of you know the most rewarding things that we do. Uh, we'll be covering some of the topics that have uh, come up and and become uh, you know more important. Um, in the last couple of years, things like hard seltzer, for example. Um, looking forward to that. Um, and yeah, I wanna thank all of you for, for also just tuning in and uh, listening to us this year. Uh, it's been a lot and I see a lot of the same, fa uh, same at least maybe not faces, but a lot of the same names in these, uh, in these sessions. And it's really cool to, to you know, get to know all of you, see this community. And if there's anything we can do to help you learn more about beer, that's really what we're here for. Um, and if you're a pro brewer, don't forget to pre-order your yeast for January. Um, everyone always needs yeast in January, and we don't want you to be disappointed. So um, your best bet will be pre-ordering. Make sure you get what you need well in advance so that you don't have to stress out about your yeast while you're on holidays. Thanks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring Nate back on here. He seems to have disappeared. All right. Uh, hey, that that was that was a good presentation. Uh, I do have a few things I want I want us to kind of just go over briefly to just dive a bit more deeply into because I think these are things that people will find useful. Uh, the first one, I just one of the questions to riff off things we have in the chat has been to do with oxygenation and starters for home brewing. Uh, so my thoughts for this, and you, you mentioned the, the O2 injection you see for the home brewers use. And I'm a little biased on these things because I absolutely despise these units. Uh, I'm not a fan of them whatsoever, but I'm not a fan of them for a reason that may not be apparent. Uh, if we are making a flask of yeast, and I actually back this up a little bit, the goal of aeration for beer is not to aerate the wort, it is to, air, to provide oxygen to the yeast cell. That is the goal of what we're trying to do here. We're not trying yeah. to aerate the wort to aerate the wort, we're trying to aerate the yeast. Uh, if you're doing a shaker, a, sorry, a, a, a starter or a flask, or, or even some people will do a little, you know, one liter starter a couple hours before they plan to knock out the brew um, on a shake table, just that that's more than enough to get oxygen into those cells by having the yeast cells with a little bit of wort sit on a shake on a stir plate for say an hour or two before you pitch it into your beer. In my experience, it's a much better way to get air oxygen into those uh, into those brews. And I, I, I often find brewers who are, you know, extra enough or go the extra mile to have a shake tape, to have a, some sort of stir plate, are also the ones who are more likely to go the extra mile and have O2 injection. But those two things kind of defeat the purpose of each other. Uh, I've always kind of found the O2 injection to be a little, you know, unnecessary. 
I, w- I mean, I would say it, it depends on the yeast, right? Like if you're oh, if yeah. you're oxygenating a culture, then there's only so much oxygen you can put in. And at the end of the day, if the yeast is is getting given a bunch of oxygen and doesn't have sugars to ferment, then you're not really creating an ideal scenario for the for the yeast mitochondria. I think it comes down to timing, right? Like yeah, absolutely. The, and like there are, uh, and I didn't I didn't include it in in this talk, but like there have been studies on oxygenating the yeast versus oxygenating the wort and tracking the impact and, and there was at least one study that showed that the results were very comparable so so it is a it is a it is a potentially effective strategy but i and i would you know just uh use the caveat that that it might not work for every yeast absolutely yeah and every single yeast is going to need more more or less than the others mm-hmm. um it's become really clear to me as we go through this that we need to do a mechanics lecture on aeration because a lot of this stuff gets falls into issues with that yeah um, a quick a quick walk through a quick uh, demo i think not even a demo just kind of some places where oxygen is uh go, go through partial pressures and line loss and you know height differentials and things like that and how it's going to cause differences uh ah, ah, beer physics beer physics we need to do some beer physics on this because I, I i think the two of us i think you'd agree on this oftentimes where we've seen we've had a handful of clients where the beer physics of this have fallen flat ah I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I have a note to mention on dry yeast, and, and despite you know being one of co-founders of Escarpment, uh, my other hat of being a professor at the college is we use a lot of dry yeast there because we have a handful of students who don't know what they're doing. So they, huh. if we gave them liquid yeast, they'd be destroying things left, right, and center, and that's that's why they're there. Um, there's nothing well, wrong with dry yeast. It's just uh, there's just not a lot of selection. Exactly. Um, but the thing that we find with dry yeast is, you know, if you don't aerate those cultures, you're going to hit FG, but the flavor is going to be not what it would be if you did not have oxygen. Same thing goes for liquid yeast. The first gen, it's going to hit FG, no problem, but the flavor profile isn't necessarily going to be there. Um, yeah. I just wanted to highlight that because that, that's a big differential I see between the two. Um, yeah, for a lot sure. of that. Yeah, there there is a difference between finishing and finishing and finishing well, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Quality is the the important part on there. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other things that are regarding the me- me- uh, mechanics of this stuff, like compressed air, the maximum saturation at, at standard atmospheric temperature being eight ppm. Eight ppm. But if you have positive head space, sorry, positive pressure in the head space, you know, it, it still applies for Henry's law. If you have line losses or things like that, it still applies for that. But that's a whole other topic for us to get into. <laughs> that, that's not the t- that was not the time. Um, I do just wanted to wanted to point out that most one of the biggest issues we see for brewers when it comes to O2 is a lot of brewers on their O2 lines do not have a flow meter. The, the, yeah, I mean, and that's sort of why I said it's a good idea to regulate pressure and flow. Yeah, I just want to highlight that you need yeah. if you're for if you're commercial brewing, you need a flow meter. Mm-hmm. Um, you can go on Amazon and get a flow meter for like 30 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be crazy. Um, one other bit for the olive oil is that that paper also had an impact where the olive oil added a uh, increased risk of staling. So if your canning line wasn't kind of up to you know top notch, you're going to start having some pro- other problems from there. I just wanted to highlight that because that's something that we've seen some, I've heard of people having issues with that. Um, yeah, and to answer the last thing you put, we've done, this is the 27th, sorry, this will be the 28th webinar. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, no video is shorter than an hour, so that gives you an idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, with that, we'll, we'll kind of start r- ripping through a handful of the questions here. So the first, the most upvoted one is, do you recommend oxygenating a yeast starter if using a stir plate and have pure O2 wand available? So we kind of already answered that one. Yeah. I mean, you like make a starter. Absolutely. Like that, that's always helpful, but uh, you probably don't need to oxygenate the starter and your wart. No, probably not. Yeah. Uh, The next question from Luke. Hey Luke um, is how does open fermentation affect wart oxygenation requirements? Uh, My two cents on this is that open fermentation is going to have a slow influx of oxygen throughout the entire fermentation. 
Um, one of the things that we've, we've highlighted in other lectures is that a little bit of O2, O2 catalyzes ester, uh, esterification processes for fusel alcohols. Uh, it also accelerates diacetyl breakdown, well, alpha acetolactate degradation into diacetyl, so it can be more readily reuptaken. Um, it's going to, having a little bit of oxygen throughout the entire ferment is going to accelerate all these things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even that, we saw that uh, in the last talk. Uh, from a few weeks ago where the English open fermentations would have the little koi tail where it would, they'd used to recirculate. That's going to simply enhance the amount of O2 that is inside the wort. So there's different ways to kind of in increase or decrease that. Yeah. Big fans of open fermentation over Big here. Fan. But yeah, it's a, it's a hard thing to implement practically. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't work. It has commercial limitations. <laughs> yeah. I've, I, I think I've, I've uh, trolled Nate many times with the the promise of turning several of our old pieces of equipment into open fermenters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on board with and them. I'm it's going to happen. Them. It's going to happen. Yeah. I, uh, w one thing I, I do want to bring up for this, though, is that uh, the whole idea with high gravity beer fermentations or e even lower gravity beers to a lesser degree of adding another O2 shot, say, 12 hours or 24 hours into fermentation, you can almost think of this as a way to somewhat replicate an open fermentation type system where you're adding a little bit more. Um, I briefly read something on a forum, this is like a year and a half ago, where someone was experimenting with during the, the first 48 hours, adding like one liter per minute per 20 hectoliters, sorry, one liter per minute of compressed air per 20 hectoliters of wort, just to try to replicate an open fermentation, but in a stainless steel CCV, a conical vessel. Oh, like like micro oxygenation. Like, well, they do that in wine, right? They do that yeah. in wine, and that was where the idea came from. Um, yeah. This isn't something that you've seen a lot of brewers grab onto, uh, but I, I think there's some potential there. It'd be, be kind of curious to. I'm curious to explore it, but yeah, I have yeah. we haven't given any con uh, time to it. Yeah, there there is a brewer in in Alberta who, who apparently is using mox uh, micro oxygenation for for like mixed culture sours, which is like to replicate what a barrel does, which is which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's really cool. Um, well, next questions: uh, the reused yeast slurries that are stored in mason jars in the fridge. Uh, what method can be used to oxygenate them? I'd default to a stir plate on this because you also want to see growth. You want to see some the cells. You know, you want kind of the the, dead, the poor health cells to produce new cells that are healthier and yeah, that the poor ones to die off. I mean, at the homebrew scale, it's so easy to to prop yeast that like you can just do a starter, like a standard starter, like a little bit of yeast and a liter or two or a wart. And, and that'll work very well to, to ensure that it performs well every time. It's like when you get into the bigger scale, like pro scale, that it becomes less practical. Yeah. The, you know, so yeah, the easy solution there is just like store the yeast, make a starter. Works most of the time. Yeah. Uh, as you reuse yeast, does it need different amounts of DO? Even if the beer volume and things like that are exactly the same. I'm gonna say no, but if you if you did something to hurt the cells, that <laughs> might change. If, yeah. if you need to do some repair on those cells, then that might be a benefit. Oh man, that that is a hard question to answer. Yeah, I'm sort of thinking like, how would you? You know, it's one of. <laughs> like it, it, it's, it's a study design that that would quickly get out of hand. Oh man, that it, that's interesting. If you were to under aerate one batch to the point, or a, 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 the same yeast cells in sequence to the point where you have, say, a decrease in sterile concentration, then I would definitely recommend over aerating the next batch so that these cells have an excess amount of sterols that are reproduced inside that one. There are mm -hmm. some issues here in regards to glycogen sterile cycling, so you don't won't, probably won't get back to the highest concentration of, of sterols that you'd want, at least not in less single in one gen. But I would. I, if you if yeah. you have made an oopsie, I would definitely recommend an over aerating. Yeah, yeah. Yeast have these like generational memories of of their past environments, right? Yeah. So <laughs> imprints. Uh, it's it, so <laughs> yeah. It can take a little while to repair that. Yeah. Uh, the next question is: uh, If using Saccharomyces cerevisiae to ferment other beverages, say meat or cider, would you recommend following the same guidelines about DO? Yeah, I, I think so. Like in general, um, I, I know meat, wine meat and class. meat and yeah, meat and well, also like the wine yeast. It's sort of it's the same situation where it's not repitched. So whatever sterol reserves are in that uh, commercial pitch is is usually sufficient. But 
Um, I mean, usually wine at least is, is oxygenated to some degree, whether it's using forced oxygen or whether it's using something like pumping over. So yeah, like that is relatively common. I, I don't know so much with, with commercial cider or, or even home, home cider or meat. I would say oxygenating up front probably helps. I would say. I'm going to put one thing out here and say that though, most of the times for meat and ciders and wines, you're looking for the yeast cells to kind of get out of the way. Yeah. And oftentimes when we aerate our cells, we're going to see an increase in an ester production and an increase in flavor profile. So there's a, there's a secondary element here in regards to what flavor profile you're trying to produce that I, I think you need to factor in here. I, I would probably still shoot for the same, but there's some tweaking that needs to be done there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, my only experience, my only experience is with sparkling wine. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, in that case, like this, the the final starters are static, like they're not shaken. So yeah, you kind of have the yeast just like in a not a very aerobic environment, and and it does just fine to get through that. Um, so the next one is, is is a little large. Is how to keep. Uh, to keep your yeast in the log phase, what is the target DO level? Uh, what would you suggest oxygen or air? Would you suggest uh, what would you suggest for the placement of the gas stone? I think we talked about that last little bit, but usually for the uh, log phase, we don't want this. We want zero oxygen. Yeah. Uh, well. Yeah. Exactly. You kind of want them to incorporate it all pretty early on. Yeah. Um, if you want to extend the log phase or the lag, either of them, then the real way to control it is temperature um, more so than oxygen concentration. Yeah. Um, I mean, lucky for us, like it, it depends on the strain, but like there's not a typically a huge performance difference between yeast that's like pitched in the log phase versus yeast that's gone to stationary, right? Like most, most beer yeasts are, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, one, one question here is, uh, so we mentioned that 8 ppm DO is kind of the max we can get with air, um, which is not enough for yeast strains. Can we compensate the lower DO with higher pitch rate? I'm going to say no. <laughs> so can, can well, we it's, That's more, more cells incorporating the same amount of oxygen. It's, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, four people in one loaf of bread versus eight people in one loaf of bread. Yeah, um, I, I do want to point w one thing out here, and this is something that I, I think it's it's clear to me. We need to have a like, mechanics of of a O2 webinar. Um, Molson, the Coors, Labatt, the big guys, they use mainly compressed air, um, but they're doing so under different methods. So you can use compressed pressure. airs pressure. It's just pressures, line losses, you know, things like that. Um, that's a mechanics thing, but there are ways to make DO go higher. You just need to follow Henry's law and go, you know, partial pressure above the liquid stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that you can't compensate for pitch rate, but what you can do is do a starter beforehand to try and keep eight, eight PPM or, or around for a longer period of time. Yeah. Um, there's about two so that, that's another good thing to do on the homebrew scale would be like a vitality starter, like taking your standard pitch and feeding it a little wart, a f you know, a few hours before before fermentation to, to get the cells active. Like that would kind of, um, I think, accomplish the goal there and help help the yeast. Like, first of all, it'll help the yeast to incorporate more oxygen. And then also, uh, yeah, if, if there is a difference between what's what's available through air and, and what the yeast needs, then it can pick up what it needs in, in a like a vitality starter, like a same day starter that might yeah. work better. Uh, there's about three more questions here that I think we can kind of, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, how much, how much O2 is too much O2? I haven't ever encountered it to be honest. We've had uh, other other than like, like there's, there, there's some beers and some yeasts where too much oxygen can kind of dull the flavor um, I would, you know, yeast, that right? might be more, yeah, and or like in lagers as well, where you really want to keep some of those delicate aromas around. Uh, yeah, Nate, what what stories have you heard? Oh, just uh, we've had we had a client or two where the again, this goes from a, a mechanics thing where the 
they inst brewery inst this is kind of a classic example where brewery installs new fermenters that are larger than any other one furthest away from the brew house so you have the longest line loss so therefore you have maximal o2 diff diffusion inside that vessel along with higher back pressure so you see solubility of the o2 that's being added approach a hundred percent where on every single one of the other tanks it's not a hundred percent Unfortunately, these breweries haven't measured DO, so I, I don't know what the exact PPM is, but I know it is possible to to get too much. I just yeah. don't know what that too much number is. Yeah, I, I was uh, like in preparation for this talk, I was looking at the ASBC fishbone on, I think it was on yeast health. And it, for, for those who, uh, you know, love to geek out about brewing science, I highly recommend an ASBC membership and highly recommend checking out the fishbone references because it's yep. like this amazing way to do, you know, root cause analysis of all sorts of brewing problems. Um, <laughs> and yeah, one of the topics was on yeast health and, and, you know, one of the points there was too much oxygen might be bad, but it's an unknown <laughs> basically. Yeah. <laughs> and the last question I, I want us to kind of hit on is, is kind of this nebulous, uh, a few questions rolled into one. Um, can we add oxygen after the yeast cells have already started fermenting? And why? And what situations would we do this? So there, kvikes often need more oxygen. We have a higher temperature fermentation, but therefore we see a less solubility. Mm -hmm. um, imperial stouts or barley wines, we have a higher degree Play-Doh. Theoretically, we need more oxygen. To, and we also yeah. want to have diacetyl issues and fusel alcohol problems in those beers. Can we? And is, is there kind of a recommended amount? Yeah, I would say... I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't... I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing. And yeah, in some of those beers, like high-gravity beers that, that, you know, benefit from that extra boost of oxygen, um, it's a good thing. You know, my commentary on that is that I think a lot of people worry that adding oxygen is going to, like, somehow massively shift the yeast metabolism which yep. is possible but also you have to keep in mind that like once you've got a lot of yeast in that fermentation they're going to gobble up the do so fast that they're not really going to have any opportunity to massively change the way that they behave the way that they um transcribe and express genes um and then the other thing to keep in mind is that you know at least in the world of Saccharomyces, we have, and I think we've talked about this before, we have the Crabtree effect where even if the yeast is given oxygen, even though oxygen is 16 times more, 18 times more efficient at uh, producing energy through respiration, that yeast is still going to ferment because it wants to produce alcohol to outcompete its, uh, its neighbors. So yep. even if you're adding oxygen, that yeast is still going to be fermenting. So uh, the Crabtree effect helps to sort of support that, yeah, you know, you can add oxygen during a fermentation and it's not going to like cause the yeast to suddenly freak out. There is, there is a bit of folklore around this whole idea that, you know, yeast cells, if you add a little bit of oxygen, they radically shift. Um, I know when I first started learning brewing science and things like that, that was something that was kind of drilled into me that you, as soon as the beer starts fermenting, you did you know, make sure it doesn't, it doesn't see, see oxygen again. And mm -hmm. as I get more and more and I also look at, look, more into kind of old school fermentation practices and understand these things. It, I, that's becoming more and more false. And I think that's one of those kind of pieces of, of you know, I, I don't want to say misinformation exactly because it was, it was meant with good intention. Um, but with these pieces that is, it is false that roams around the, the beer industry that, you know, you can, you can add a little bit of oxygen in there and oftentimes there can be some benefits to flavor pending the yeast strain you're working with. Yeah. Uh, the last question, I think we'll wrap it up on this, is, is there a in desired P PPM for Pretenomyces in oxygen? <laughs> I think we, I thought we'd finish on this one. because I thought I thought that would come up. Um, I would like to know more about that. It is not something that we have studied and it's something we would love to study after after a long hiatus. We are getting back into researching Brett. Um, the problem with Brett is that doing any experiment with it sucks yeah. because it's so unpredictable, <laughs> but we're getting back into researching Brett. We're doing a project right now to, you know, once again, try to speed up the primary fermentation. So 
Uh, hopefully that is successful. And you know, that's one of the next things to try is um, what is the ideal DO for Brett? Um, <laughs> this is going to sound very controversial, but I have a strong suspicion that, you know, mul oxygenating multiple times, especially in the lag phase, is probably going to speed up Brett fermentation a lot. Um, and the thing to keep in mind with Brett and oxygen is that if there's no alcohol, then you're not going to make acetic acid, right? Like, so adding oxygen before the Brett's started making alcohol is very safe. Um, so we're going to experiment with that as well. Um, I think that, that that is something that needs to be uh, tried because as far as I know, there, there's not really much advice. I think the general advice we would give is, you know, use a standard amount, but because the Brett lag phase is so long, there might be a need for a different oxygenation strategy for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, We'll we'll communicate. We'll announce that those findings whenever we uh, whenever we get get whenever we do the research. Oh, anything with Brett is uh, is a challenge. Yes, always. <laughs> All right, um, I think we'll wrap it up for there. Thanks everyone for for hanging out with us, and I uh, hope you guys learned a little bit about oxygen. Yep, uh, and check out everything else on YouTube if you get a chance. If you uh, if you. You're feeling bored or feeling like learning a little thing or two about brewing science. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care, everyone.